Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 16th, 2010, and my guest is Gary Greenberg, psychologist and author. Today we'll be talking about the ideas in two of his books, The Noble Lie and Manufacturing Depression. Gary, welcome to Econ Talk. Well, thanks. Glad to be here. The book, uh, The Noble Lie, suggests that our use of medicine is not always as scientific as we'd like it to be, but it's sometimes convenient, even though it may not always be quite true. Uh, what's your argument there? What do you give us the general argument? Well, the, I think uh, you just did a pretty good job of it. Uh, I think what happens is that science, especially in the post-religion uh, age, um, science has become our most reliable source of truth, and truth underlies our determinations of value. So people try to make decisions about how to live their lives or. Um, you know how to treat each other uh, based on what they what they think the truth is about the way the world works. Um, if I decide to uh, drive my car, if I decide not to drive my car but rather to ride my bicycle because I don't want to contribute to the greenhouse effect, then I do that because I have some kind of value. I place some kind of value on um, preserving the environment. I've come to think that that's something that's truly important. And I think that once we aren't all united by the same religion or the same belief in God, then the question of what makes life worth living and what makes, um, and, and why, uh, that's what makes, you know, the question of what the good is and why it's good um, is, thrown into, is thrown into disarray. And we can start to disagree about it, as we do, especially in our time right now. And so science helps us because science says anyway that it has scientists say that they have reached final decisions final determinations about the nature of reality so it's very very compelling if i say scientifically speaking it is true that eating um lots of eggs will increase your cholesterol and that will make you likely to die young then there aren't any questions to be asked anymore and so I think that when we, especially in the realm of medicine, the more that we can say these things, the less confusing life becomes. So what my book is about is the way that that compelling power of science has been adopted, sometimes um, by, uh, sometimes inappropriately, let's say. It's been adopted by people who are advocating for certain positions. Um, so the most obvious example, I think in my book, the clearest example is the example of brain death. Brain death is this idea that if your brain has been destroyed, even if your heart is still beating and you're still breathing, even with the help of a machine, you're, you're dead. That is an idea that was developed in the late 1960s, and it was developed to facilitate organ transplant. The problem is you need to be able to get organs out of bodies quickly in order to transplant them into other bodies. And when I say quickly, I mean ideally you take them out of a body when the heart and when the blood is still circulating, because as soon as your blood stops circulating, your organs deteriorate. So that raises a very difficult question, which is, let's say you have somebody who's grievously injured, who you know is not going to recover, whose brain is destroyed, and they're still breathing, and you want to take out their organs. From a medical standpoint, what you really want to do is take them out while the person is still uh, breathing. You know, I noticed she didn't say alive. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's it's tempting. The problem, right? It's tempting to say that. And that's the yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, this is the problem. From from our sort of common sense point of view, that person is alive. They're warm, they're they're flush, they're breathing, their heart's beating, they're metabolizing everything that's 
would normally be going on in your body is going on. They just don't have any consciousness. Well, in 1968, when this issue came up, um, the problem was that uh, nobody wanted to uh, nobody wanted to facilitate heart transplants by uh, by uh, by condoning what amounted to murder. No doctors wanted to kill people by taking their hearts out. So rather than just grapple directly with that idea, um, what they did was they just moved the line between life and death back a little bit. So that rather than simply deciding, okay, we're going to take this person's heart out and they will then die, they made it so that the person could die and then they could take their heart out. By changing the definition, essentially. By changing the definition of death. And when they did that, they sold that as an idea about biology. There were all these convoluted scientific explanations for why it was really true. All along, we thought death occurred when the heart stopped beating, but we'd been wrong for thousands of years. Really, death occurs when the brain no longer functions, which was... It, 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 there's no way around it. That's a philosophical question. But the doctors who were trying to uh, create a possibility of saving other lives with organ transplant... Um, didn't want to get into that debate. They well, would rather just say, okay, scientifically speaking, that person's dead, even if they look alive. And what's fascinating about both your books <clears throat> is that, that, that I've read is that you force the reader to think about the interface between morality, philosophy, and science, and medicine, uh, those sort of four things that merge together, and that often we are encouraged culturally – to think that medicine is um, – it's just science, and so all these decisions are just scientific decisions. But in fact, as you point out, they're usually deeply moral and philosophical decisions as well about what kind of lives we want to lead, what kind of people we want to be, how we see ourselves. So you make a nice contrast between, say, a tumor, which – taking um, medicine to fight a tumor, most people would say is a good idea, and being unhappy, which um, people also now say is something like a tumor, perhaps. And yet, as you point out, it's not that simple. Right. And, and so at, at, the point, at the point that you see that model, uh, uh, that, that, that paradigm expanding to encompass more and more of our lives, you know, you see why the noble lie is such an important um, concept. Because, you know, in its original conception, the noble lie was something that the philosophers knew was not true, but which enabled people to do things um, that otherwise they wouldn't be able to do or to have convictions that they otherwise wouldn't be able to have. So a few people were the guardians of the truth, and everybody else benefited from that. So in the case that the comparison that you just made, it's really obvious why we would want to have medicine to treat tumors or diabetes or something like that. But if we, and it's also obvious that nobody's going to frown on that, or very few people are, perhaps Christian scientists are, but most people aren't going to frown on that. But in our society, to take drugs to feel better is considered uh, a bad thing to do. But if you call the feeling bad, whatever it is, a disease, and say, you know, doctors have found that it's a disease, so when I take a drug for it, let's say I take Prozac for it, then I'm not breaking the, the, the more, the cultural uh, taboo. Exactly, by taking those drugs. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm treating a disease. And I argue in both of these books that that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, the, 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 the creation of that lie in order to facilitate something that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. But on the other hand, it starts with the assumption that we can't handle the truth, which I always find to be a dangerous assumption. Yeah, it's dangerous partly because it, it leads to manipulation and the accumulation of power in places we might not want it to be. But it also is um, seems just a titch inauthentic about the human right. enterprise. And I think that part you know, shines through rather rather dramatically. I, I want to start, though, with an example that, that you start – I think you start the, the noble eye with, which is addiction. Um, it used to be that alcohol – the use of alcohol 
to excess, which is a hard phrase to define. Um, but drinking a lot was seen as a character defect, but it came to be viewed as a disease. Talk about the history of that and um, what you think is good and bad about it. Okay, well, well, first of all, you know, we have to remember that even before it was considered to be a character defect, lots of drinking was considered to be normal. So, so good point. It, has, it has a long history, <laughs> yeah. this question of, of inebriation. Um, we know that colonial America, for all of its uh, um, Puritan um, background, was still a place where there was a lot of drinking going A lot on. of beer. Yeah, <laughs> beer, beer, ale, rum. Rum yeah. was big, right? So anyway... The water wasn't so good was one reason, but, the, but was life that? was yeah. the other reason. What, say the second reason? Uh, life. Uh, the, the first reason was it was a, a safe source of, of hydration, but the second reason was life was sometimes not so easy. Right, and, and it's possible, although I don't really know this, that people who were in states of inebriation were, first of all, more able to function because they learned better how to deal with their inebriation, and secondly, uh, the expectation of sobriety just wasn't as strong as it is now. In any event, as time goes on, and it isn't very long, sometime by the, uh, by, certainly by the 18th century in the United States, the, the drinking shows up as a, as a problem. And the question is, what kind of problem is it? Well, some people think that it is a, a character problem, uh, you know, a failure to, um, to live a righteous life. Um, and Self-restraint. Uh, other people start to think of it as a... Um, as a disease. And of course, in, in the 18th century, the word disease meant something a little different from what we think of it now. So anyway, flash forward now to the, to the 20th century, and uh, the country has been uh, torn apart in some ways by this issue. The, the, the women's temperance movement, which came in around the late 19th, early 20th century, um, ultimately, uh, as part of a deal to um, facilitate the suffrage, um, prohibition comes in to play. And the amendment is passed, and drinking becomes illegal, and of course people find all sorts of ways around it. But what it's really happened, enough. one of the things that happened as a result of prohibition, is that excessive drinking got pushed even farther underground. Um, <clears throat> they just couldn't be acknowledged as much of a social problem. So when, after prohibition failed, uh, and and was repealed in the early 1930s, and people started to drink again, and the problem of excessive drinking was once again uh, a problem that we could look at, there was no infrastructure in place to deal with people who were having trouble um, with drinking. And it fell back to the ministers, um, to, to the church, and to the other forces of moral suasion in the society to deal with alcoholics. Um, but doctors who had had an interest in this subject for a long time really thought that they should be the first line of treatment of people uh, who were alcoholic. And they were having a lot of trouble getting purchase um, on, the, on, the, on, on, the, on the resources and on the sort of imagination of, uh, of the people. And they engaged a um, public relations expert. This is at the end of the 1930s. They engaged a public relations expert who was himself a, an alcoholic, a recovering alcoholic, to figure out how they could sell themselves as doctors, how doctors could sell themselves as the primary um, treatment for treaters of alcoholism. And this guy came up with a very simple idea. He wrote a paper that they published in, in their quarterly journal of, psycho, of alcoholic studies, of alcohol studies. Uh, they wrote this, he wrote this article in which he said that the way to do this is to turn alcoholism into a disease. If you convince the world that this is a disease, then of course what they will do is they will come to you for treatment because you're the people who treat diseases. And this happened to be at the same time that Alcoholics Anonymous was uh, taking off. And these two lines of thinking that, first of all, alcoholism is a disease, and secondly, that the disease is to be treated through, this, uh, through Alcoholics Anonymous, they converged. And, it, be, and, it, and it, it became a very powerful and ultimately, quickly, the dominant idea 
in America. But it's important to remember that the idea that alcoholism is a disease was invented by a public relations guy. Doctors who study diseases, and what we usually mean by a disease is a, a, a kind of suffering that has a biochemical dysfunction behind it. You can find it under a microscope. Yeah, you know, that's, they, or they a, spent or a, or years looking, looking for it under the microscope and have never succeeded, even to this day. They haven't succeeded. They're always telling us they're on the verge of it. The re- most recent thing uh, being, uh, you know, some combination of neuroscience and genetics. Um, but <clears throat> uh, while they've been pretty good at figuring out some of the neurological consequences uh, of drinking, the neurochemical consequences of, of addiction, uh, the idea that it's a disease that is that it originates in the body still hasn't been proved, and frankly, I'm not sure it's ever going to be. So what you have is a myth. The myth that alcoholism and addiction are diseases is a very effective myth in the sense that it captures the imagination. It's also an effective myth in that it allows people to go for treatment and to take care of themselves. It allows people to allow doctors to take care of them. Um, instead of uh, feeling like there's something um, pathological in the sense of, of a of sin, there's something or, sinful or, about it. Or a character flaw. Yeah. A character flaw or something like this. So, <clears throat> and, and so in this way, it helps to have that lie out there. Now, no doctor, no self-respecting doctor is going to say, yes, I know what the biochemical cause of addiction is. He's, he, among themselves, doctors will freely admit that they don't know yet. They, they figure they're going to find it, but they don't know yet. But to their patients, that's not what they're going to say. They're going to tell them it's a disease, and here's what we're going to do about it. And people find that helpful. On the other hand, um, I think we've seen that to call something a disease is also to open up the possibility that people will stop well, there's a certain kind of responsibility that people won't take for their behavior. It also has implications in the forensic realm. We see this over and over yeah. again, where people are using as legal defenses the fact that they have a disease. Sure. Uh, I have to make two side points, and uh, then I want to come back to addiction. The first is, running through all of our conversation today, I want listeners to think about the parallels between this conversation and macroeconomics, which don't seem exactly parallel, but they, of course, uh, ring a lot of bells with me. We have a complex system called the body. We have a lot of stories we tell about it, and we have some real insights into how the body works, Uh, medical insights, genetic insights. Uh, There are pathological things. There are organisms. There's invasions. There's viruses. There's tumors. There are physical, measurable things that go wrong with the body, and we know sometimes how to fix them. But we don't totally understand it, and particularly we don't really have a very good understanding of the interaction between the mind and the body, which we'll come more back, back to more. And similarly, the, the economy is a complex organism, and we like to talk as if we understand it scientifically, but a lot of times it's scientism, uh, a theme that definitely runs through your books, which is what you might call fake science, the illusion of science. There's some empirical support. But mainly we're telling stories that comfort us or support our views or our biases or our power uh, as either doctors or economists or policymakers. Uh, That's the first aside. The second aside is this other sub-theme which runs through the books, which I'm fascinated by, which is the creeping expansion of power by doctors, sometimes legally, sometimes through policy, and sometimes just through culture, that we turn to them for all that ails us um, and what doctors – ask us as patients now um, is not what they ask people 30 and 40 and 50 years ago, and they feel totally comfortable doing it. And I sometimes find myself saying to my doctor, it's none of your business. Uh, but they view much of my life as their purview in ways that I don't. Um, uh, they have a shamanism about them as well that is part of what your your first point that many of us uh, and culturally we turn to doctors and medicine as a sort of source of not just truth but comfort. But I want to get back to addiction. Uh, are you suggesting that there is no genetic basis for alcoholism? Are you suggesting that there is no physical aspect to addiction um, when you make your claim that they haven't uncovered the uh, bioneurological neurological basis for addiction? Yeah, not, not at all. I mean, genetic, you know, I think what we're finding out with the genome-wide association study and its failure to show much of any, anything uh, 
you know, I think there was a time when scientists hoped that they were going to find correspondences like they know about for Huntington's uh, uh, disease or something like that, where there's a more or less one-to-one correspondence. But in fact, uh, we're finding that the best you're going to do is a very small percentage of cases accounted for by a particular genetic variant. So I, I think it's clear that alcoholism is in families, and that points to the possibility of uh, genetic um, uh, causes, but I think that we're a long way from finding those. As far as a physiological aspect to addiction, well, of course. I mean, geez, if you pack your body full of, of uh, poison in the case of alcohol or, uh, you know, uh, substances that work by changing your brain chemistry over and over and over again, if you don't think that's going to have an effect, you're not paying attention. You know, if you don't think that's going to have, have an effect, you have to wonder what you're smoking. Yeah. Uh, so, but the, so, but yeah, the, key, but the it, key question, the key question is, um, nicotine is addictive. People do stop smoking. Out, the, the word addictive obviously can mean produces a chemical thing in your body that makes it harder and harder to do without it. It can also mean something you like a lot. And what I want to know is, do we have any evidence for a scientific distinction between those two things? So to take an example that's not chemical, uh, at least it doesn't seem to be chemical, but of course it could be, uh, getting on the internet. Some people are, quote, addicted to the internet. They, they have to check their email compulsively, surf their Facebook account compulsively. Many of us are in that category. And the question is, what does compulsively mean? What does it mean to go without is there something physical, chemical going on in our bodies when we go without? Is there? Uh, I, I think that there, I'm sure that every experience that we have, craving, this conversation, love, whatever, has, is utterly dependent on biochemistry, uh, and particularly brain chemistry. To go back to the first thing we were talking about, brain death, without a brain, you got nothing. Uh, so I don't doubt that there's a, always uh, some kind of biochemical thing happening, and, and, and I think we should all be grateful for that. Okay, um, but can we establish the distinction between, let's, what the, between say, compulsion and addiction, uh, between really liking something and being hooked on it? Can we establish that uh, through biology? I really doubt it. And even if we could, I'm not sure that we would know as much as we would know what we need to know. For instance, there's a lot of documented evidence that re- veterans returning from Vietnam in the 60s and 70s with really, really big heroin addictions, and by the way, addicted to really good heroin, stopped using it when they got back here. They didn't have to think of themselves as lifelong addicts, you know, that were going to be in recovery for the rest of their lives and they didn't have to have go to, go to through, AA meetings. They didn't have to go through methadone or... Yeah, they just stopped because their context changed. So the danger of answering, yes, it's a biochemical thing and that's all there is to it, which is, at this point, the major thrust of research in this country, if not the primary, the only one. Uh, certainly, it's the, the stated position of the director of the National Institutes of Drug Abuse. The danger of that is that it fails to take into account the actual context in which people are using, abusing, and suffering with these drugs. Well, let's turn to the question of uh, depression, which uh, I first came across your work uh, from a program we did with Louis Menand, who in an mm-hmm. article reviewed your book and uh, I think it's Erwin Kirsch's book, yes. which has a different perspective. Maybe we'll come to his work later, but I want to start with yours. Um, you really have some remarkably provocative and and very unpopular uh, to some people uh, ideas on – what pharmaceuticals uh, can do and cannot do for uh, our mental problems. So talk about your uh, view on depression and the pharmaceutical revolution that, is, that has come across America. Well, one, one thing that we could um, – we, one, one way to, to look at this is that and, – and one of the things I write about in, in my book is that our current understanding of depression um, in some ways is the tail wagging the dog. The drugs came first. Uh, not that people don't get depressed, not that people haven't gotten depressed for all, all of human history. My book traces it back to the book of Job, which is one of the earliest uh, 
written uh, accounts that we have, um, not not that in at least in some cases, depression isn't really isn't just like any other uh, disease that something goes awry in your body and as the result of it you become depressed. Um, so all of that is true, but at the same time, what's happened over the last fifty years or so is that the question of who um, is depressed and exactly why has uh, increasingly been answered um, by people who have an interest in selling drugs. Yeah. Yeah, the answer, of course, to the first question is increasingly the question, who is depressed? The answer is, of course, all of us, it yeah, turns as, out. As, as that's many, a bigger as, market. <laughs> exactly. It's a huge market because in real life, life is hard. And uh, it's possible, particularly given the the sort of, uh, particularly given the context-free and somewhat vague uh, definition of, the official definition of depression, it is possible for an awful lot of people um, to meet the criteria. Furthermore, and probably much more importantly, you don't have to meet the criteria to be told by your family doc that you're, you have depression um, and that you ought to take antidepressants for it. And on top of that, you don't have to have a disease of depression in order to feel better when you take the drugs. So the, the, um, the, the potential is out there for lots of people to either be diagnosed with or self-diagnosed or just think of themselves as depressed in a medical sense and to think that the thing that's gone, the problem that they have is that they have a biochemical imbalance in their brains and that the solution to that problem is to take uh, drugs for it. It's really a remarkable thing. Um... Well, it is. It is, and 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 to get back to your question about you know where this comes from, there was a series of accidental discoveries in the 1950s that were really a convergence of accidents, who which ultimately uh, resulted in a a belief that um, brain chemistry uh, determined our moods. Uh, and most of those accidental discoveries had to do with people taking drugs and unexpectedly feeling better. So once the pharmaceutical companies were in possession of these drugs that they knew made people feel better, they had a real interest in figuring out how to medicalize that discovery. And by and large, the solution to that problem had to do with uh, convincing doctors and then eventually consumers that their troubles constituted a disease. Yeah, it's um, there's, there's a third piece to it, which is the increasing subsidy of of medical care by third parties, either government aided through tax deductions or outright government programs, which made the price of indulging in this myth cheap um, and funneled money from taxpayers to drug companies. So that wasn't the plan explicitly stated. It's what it does. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic to the um, to the argument, and it's a frightening uh, it's a frightening thing. Not just again because of the power and the the resource consequences of that, but what it does to us as human beings. Um, so before we go any further, just what do we know scientifically about the impact of these drugs on deeply depressed people? Not just people who are a little unhappy. You know, there's there's a huge language issue here, which you talk about extremely well in the book, uh, about about how hard it is to measure these and define it. I guess the first thing you, I, I want you to talk about is what is the evidence that there is an imbalance of brain chemistry to explain why people uh, struggle to deal with life. Well, uh, there are different kinds of evidence. The, the most immediate, obvious evidence is the um, drugs, uh, the fact that drugs work. <laughs> so, I mean, drugs work by biochemistry. So part of what's going on is that uh, something is changing in the brain in such a way as to make people feel better. And it's very tempting to conclude from that that there was something wrong in the brain in the first place. Of course, if you smoke a joint and you feel better, you don't necessarily think that you had, you know, cannabis deficit disorder or whatever. Sure. Um, so that line of evidence 
while on the surface of it, it's, it's maybe, it's certainly the most obvious. It's the one that's with us every day. It's the one that sort of seals the deal for a lot of people. Inductive. Yes, it's, but it's not the strongest. The strongest would be a, a series of different studies showing brain defects in people who commit suicide, um, increasing imaging studies that show the brains of depressed people, especially severely depressed people, functioning, their, their brains functioning differently, um, studies that uh, show that um, in some cases anyway, the hippocampus, for instance, is smaller than, which is a, a, a region of the brain that's associated with mood, is smaller than um, in, in people who aren't depressed. There's a, a subgroup of depressed people who are, um, you know, who, who if, you, if you give them a, 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 a particular steroid, they metabolize it differently from other people. So there are some indications that depression is biochemical, but let's go back to what I said earlier, which is that all of our experience is biochemical. Really, the, the, the weight of the idea that depression is a disease is that it originates in biochemistry that either it's just something that happens by accident, like we think of many um, other diseases, you like get a diabetes tumor. Yeah. or so on, or it's something that happens because you have a stressor and you have a vulnerability, and once that stressor kindles your depression, it doesn't shut off. And so this thing that you were always vulnerable to gets started, and then it doesn't stop. Now, all of these have a kind of, uh, you know, there's a scientific uh, dimension to them. There are studies that indicate that it's true, uh, but they all suffer from the same problem, which is basically a chicken and egg problem. The problem they suffer from is, is showing that there's a biochemistry, uh, say a biochemical signature to uh, depression or to some forms. Of, is that the same thing? as saying that it just sort of arises arbitrarily and it is best looked at as a biochemical problem. And one of the things I'm concerned about in the book is to say, okay, well, let's, let's just look at that. Let's say, let's say that we decide that's what depression is. What are some of the consequences of that? And some of the consequences are things you were talking about earlier, the centralization of power, uh, the, the flow of money, and uh, perhaps most disturbingly, the attribution of important human experiences to arbitrary and uh, impersonal forces like the chemicals rocketing around in your brain. Yeah, that last one is, the, I think, the one that's uh, – as an economist, I'm supposed to be more interested in the first two. But as a human being, um, I found the third one the most uh, gripping, I have to say, which is – and I, I just want to mention a moment – in your book, which rather extraordinary, um, as, as you point out, you, when you go in and you say, I don't, I'm not so happy, I'm not feeling well, I'm blue, I'm down, or even worse, I can't get out of bed, I'm struggling to fulfill my normal responsibilities uh, or what, expect it, what are expected of me, you'd think you'd go in for a blood test or a CAT scan that would say, well, your, your hippocampus has been distorted and we just have to you know, do, do surgery or – uh, give you this drug. That isn't what they do. They ask you a set of questions. This is just, as a layperson, it, it shocked me to read about your, your experience and participating in the study, and I want you to talk about it. Why don't we start with that? Talk, talk about you went into to, to get, expecting to be diagnosed as minorly depressed, and were surprised to find out you weren't, and how that judgment was made is unbelievable. Yeah, and, and this is how uh, these judgments are made in general. But what happened was that I, I as a journalist, um, wanted to, had long wanted to be inside a clinical trial because it's a very interesting process scientifically, politically, socially. But <clears throat> I, I hesitated um, to lie my way into a clinical trial. Although in, in psychiatry, that wouldn't be very hard because, as you just pointed out, there's no blood test. And being a clinician, I know the diagnostic criteria for all the mental illnesses, so it's easy enough for me to show up, say I had them, and get into a study. Um, and then like a scientific out. study came along, a clinical trial came along for a um, 
uh, people with minor depression, and minor depression is one of these sort of quasi-diseases that they'd like to make an official disease, but they haven't quite yet, which only requires that you have a depressed mood for a couple of weeks and two of the other symptoms of major depression, there, and there are nine, and they can include, you know, trouble sleeping and uh, appetite disturbance. They can be relatively minor and common uh, ailments. Proving either that we're all depressed or this definition is expanded to be meaningless. It's, there, it could be either one. Right, right? it could yeah. be. And, and there's certainly evidence in both directions. Yes, there is. Uh, and, and especially when I did this, it was uh, during the uh, George Bush administration. So, you know, I figured how hard would that be for everybody to feel this way. But, uh, so I went and I, um, I uh, answered the question. So what they do is they give you a test that is tied to the diagnostic criteria. One of the things they want to know is, you know, have you been sleeping well? And they, that's one of the criteria is it disturbances in sleep. So they ask you if you have disturbances in sleep. The thing is maddeningly simplistic. And it functions like a troubleshooting chart. As the doctor goes down the list of questions, if you answer yes here, then he's directed to the question, six questions later. And if you answer no, he's directed to another question. And, you know, at the end of the process, they have a diagnosis for you. It takes about 45 minutes. Um, it's not generally done by therapists. It's usually done only in research settings this way. And it has nothing to do with or very little to do with how you're actually coming across or what you actually think about your own experience. So the diagnosis is made as impersonally and as much like a blood test as possible. That's the whole point. They want to make this thing it's seem ob- medical. It's objective. Yeah, see, exactly. And, and it's it's it is objective it's because, you know, you're forced to answer these questions like, are you feeling excessively self-guilt, uh, excessively guilty? Yeah. You're forced to answer yes or no when you may not even know what those words mean. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good with words. I don't know what those words mean. Yeah. Uh, I think the right question you asked at a couple places was compared to what? Compared to to you? Compared to me six months ago? But but when I didn't have that stress about my mortgage, you know, it's (laughs) compared compared to how I want to be. Yeah. Um, And and what do you mean by guilty? And shouldn't we all feel a little guilty? And on and on and on. I mean, so so the objectivity of these questions is really on the one hand compelling, and on the other hand illusory. Yeah. Um. So the diagnosis is made, and I wasn't, I didn't have minor depression. Uh, According to the book, I had major depression, which is supposed to be a a debilitating illness. Uh, The whole, anytime you talk to a doctor, well, you know, there's all these people that are getting overdiagnosed depression. If If the diagnosticians were doing their job, they would come up with fewer depressed people because it's a debilitating illness. Well, there I was, you know. Yep. I was talking about neuroscience with the guy. I had shown up, I'd driven 90 miles to be there, I got there on time, I was dressed, I was clean, I was joking. It just shows you how dangerous it is, because you, you actually thought you were semi-functioning. Yeah, I thought and, I was okay. But you were, it turns out, deeply sick. I was really sick, right. So, my, so my, my, I, I, I went into this trial, they offered me a different trial from the one I'd signed up for, and in this particular trial, and for this I'm grateful, um, the drug of the drug uh, under study was uh, omega three fatty acids, Woo-hoo. which are available in you know fish oil and other sources. Yeah, live it up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I was given you know a mega dose of either I didn't know if they were omega threes or if it was just regular if it was a placebo because all these studies are compared to placebo, and so for eight weeks or so I took these drugs, and every two weeks I showed up back at the clinic and took the same tests over and over again to see if I was getting better. And this is how all of these drugs, you know, the omega-3s and the Prozacs get uh, approved. It's really one of the extraordinary things about it is that the measure of efficacy is, of course, self-reported um, and slightly contaminated by the fact that you're sitting face-to-face with a person who has a, a stake in the outcome – uh, who you might want to please, who you might not not want to please. I mean, there, there's again, there's no there's no lab test here. It, no, it's, and, it's, and and that's you know that the problem with that isn't that there you know there there ought to be a lab test. The problem is that we're trying to make one. We're trying to reduce a set a, a complex experience to one uh, to to a test, whether it's a lab test or one of these uh, paper and pencil tests, the point is 
that we should probably be a whole lot more cautious and a whole lot more smart about the extent to which we try to reduce these complex experiences to numbers on a page. My favorite moment, uh, as I was reading uh, Manufacturing Depression this week, we just happened to be in a time in the Jewish calendar, which is the 10 days of repentance, when a a person is supposed to look into his soul and and try to be a better person, live better, uh, be a better person, examine one's flaws and try to improve them. And in your conversation, as I'm reading this uh, during these 10 days, your encounter with the psychiatrist, you're asked the, the or the clinician, you're asked the question, are you excessively self-critical? Right. And you said, uh, again, compared to what? And you sparred with her a little bit, and she said, I think you have her saying, she murmured something like, well, I don't think it's ever good to be excessively self-critical. Right. But, of course, one could argue that's the essence of the human enterprise. Yeah, right. You well, should be excessively self-critical. Improve yourself. Grow. Right. And, and without, you know, of course, what she's really trying to say is, well, there's, a, there's an optimal level of self-criticism, which may be. Could be. Uh, but, but certainly um, she's not making those fine distinctions, and she's not allowing for, you know, there's people out there that probably ought to be more critical of themselves than they are. <laughs> and there's probably people out there who should be less so. Yeah. But the point is that there's no allowance for that. It's all, it doesn't matter what your context is. It doesn't matter if you're upset about uh, somebody dying or the fact that they've canceled your favorite TV show. If you've suffered, uh, you know, if, if you're depressed, it doesn't matter why you think you're depressed. The fact is you are, and therefore you have a disease. And an interesting sidelight, if you don't mind if I go on about that, go ahead. is that um, one of the... One of the problems, as, as the depression, so as, as, the, as the drug companies and the doctors wanted to figure out a way to, just as the, just as the doctors with the alcoholism wanted to get alcohol under their purview, as doctors, psychiatrists were trying to figure out how to get depression under their purview, one of the things that they seized upon was redefining uh, depression as a series of um, symptoms, as opposed to uh, a, a, an overall impression that a person has. Or makes, and they did that um, quite nicely by coming up with these nine criteria. But the problem was that one of the, the, the uh, a study was done in which it was shown that people who are recently bereaved show up as depressed. In other words, if you give this test to somebody who just had a death in the family, it's very likely that they're going to show up with all the signs of clinical depression. Trouble sleeping, yeah, guilt over how they treated the person or contributed. Which, which flies in the face of common sense and it flies in the face of justice. Yeah. Do we really want to be calling our, our bereavement ill? Right. Our bereaved people sick? I mean, that's, is that fair? So... Uh, not to mention, do we want to think about you know taking Prozac because your wife died? Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, and it happened that the woman who did that research was also on the committee that was making the definition of depression over again. This is in the early seventies, and so they decided that you were not depressed if your symptoms were the result of a bereavement, and you got unless you unless they persisted for a long time. Uh, ultimately, hard, two months. Hard to define because you could yeah. we could so, argue that you should be depressed for a year or five. <laughs> right. Well, so uh, right there it was arbitrary, but at least they carved out an exception. Yeah, that's true. So over the last, you know, that's a really that's a, one of those great Achilles heels in this whole scheme is the the bereavement exception. And uh, critically critical thinking um, researchers have been poking at it for a long time, and they finally managed to do some research where they showed that in many ways there is no difference between being bereaved of your loved one and losing your job or getting a divorce or any of the other terrible things that can happen to people. Um, and so they presented this evidence and they said, look, you can't single out this one social stressor. You have to take all of them into account. Well, the DSM, the, the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that has all these diagnoses in it, is currently being revised, and this would have been the time to figure out what to do about this problem. And they did figure it out. What they decided to do was to remove the bereavement exception. (laughs) So all depression, all any time you show up with these criteria, you're depressed. It doesn't matter why. This is just, you know, to me it's astonishing, not only because it's such a terrible idea, but because the psychiatrists who are doing this 
and I just actually am working on a story where I've been talking to these guys, they don't seem to understand why it's a bad idea. No. They don't seem to get that if they're going to start calling this kind of thing illness, they're going to lose people. You know, every time I write a book or a story about this stuff, I get I get virtual hate mail. I was going to say, you, I know you get a lot of hate mail. Oh, my God. You know, I got, I got a guy call, uh, wrote back to me the other day saying that he would no way sit for an interview with me because people who think that depression isn't a disease are like people who don't believe in evolution. Right. So, and, and you're going to make people kill themselves. Right. But, you know, I'm thinking, okay, that's fine. Maybe that's true. But really, if you continue to diagnose, to say that people who, whose wife just died are sick, then you're going to lose the confidence of the American people. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Right. No, maybe, because I think the, the, the deep philosophical issue here, which, which you know, you present over and over again in, 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 in different settings and in, in different contexts is, you know, uh, being unhappy isn't, isn't pleasant. <laughs> right. and, and, and should we medicate away our unhappiness or is there something about the authenticity of human life that says that when we lose a loved one or when we lose a job or when we fail at something we've been ex- expecting to succeed at, is that an opportunity for growth or is it a good time to take a drug or get drunk? Um, you know, I, and, and I have to say that on that question, I am uh, really agnostic. My, my book, you know, one of the I know things, you're not you're not preaching anything there, but that's the issue you lay out, and yeah, it's well, a good I, question. I try to lay it out in this fashion. I don't have an animus against people taking drugs to feel better. Um, I, in fact, I write in the book about my own experiences with taking what you know illicit drugs to do that, uh, with some effects on my own depression, which I'm, yeah. I'm, I've written about. And the, the, I don't. I actually think that um, the problem isn't so much the drugs themselves. But the context in which they're used, and in this case, what people think they're doing when they take drugs. If I think I'm taking a drug to feel better um, because I'm in the middle of some kind of crisis, it's very likely that I'm going to look at that as a temporary relief from something that I otherwise can't get away from, and maybe even use it as an opportunity to sort of recharge my battery so I can come back. If I think I'm taking a drug because I have a biochemical imbalance, then I'm, I'm in a whole different world there. Yeah, now I'm talking about fixing an illness, and I don't even have to take the meaning of my, un, my unhappiness seriously. So it isn't so much the drug as the meaning of the drug. And there's plenty of evidence that drug effects change with what we're told to expect from them. So yeah. that people who take Prozac, um, one of the things that determines their experience is what their doctors tell them taking the Prozac is about. Well, that's a, let's turn to that question, which I want to put it under a broader umbrella, which is efficacy. So let's put aside the, we've been making fun of this nine question diagnostic thing as not being so scientific, that it has language issues, which are inherently uh, vague, flawed, and unscientific. Let's put that to side. There are definitely people who don't feel so well. We, as you say, some of it's biochemical, maybe all of it's biochemical, uh, but it's complicated. Uh, what do we know about the efficacy of of these uh, pharmaceutical solutions for making people feel better? Well, we don't know enough. What we know is that if you measure the effect of antidepressants on depression defined as those nine criteria, that if you have um, a sort of mild to moderate depression, it's very difficult in populations to find uh, an advantage of antidepressants over placebos. Uh, Did 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 that come out clearly? Yes, it did. Okay. We know that. We know that in the more severely depressed people that the antidepressants do slightly better than the uh, drugs. Than the placebos. Than the placebos, I'm sorry. Um, Now, the conclusion that's been drawn from this is that antidepressants don't work and that what they really are is uh, just placebos, expensive and side effect uh, causing placebos. And, and that conclusion is based on the fact that the quote cure rate is not a hundred percent and only slightly better than uh, taking a, a sugar pill. Yes, and, and we should say you know the numbers are in the forty to sixty percent range. So it's, it's important to mention that because you, you get a lot of hate mail, not just from psychiatrists who see you as a threat, 
but from patients I see who, who write about you and say, hey, this saved my life. I, right. I, I couldn't get up in the morning. I, I took this, this medication, and I, I can live. Yes, and, and, and surely and, there are such people. And, well, not only that, but this is the deep mystery. The, the, the drugs are only investigated as antidepressants. This is, this is where the industry is hoisted on its own petard. I totally disagree with Irving Kirsch, who is the psychologist you mentioned before. I, 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 sorry, I should say I totally agree with him in, in terms of his findings. He has mined the data, and he's the hero. He's the guy that shows that these drugs don't do the thing that the drug companies say they do. But I disagree with him because he concludes from that that the drugs don't do anything. The drugs just don't do what the industry wants them to do, and the industry wants them to do this thing because that's the only way they can sell the drugs. And so what is it that they actually we don't know. do do? We don't know. Because Meaning? nobody has yet – well, that's not true, nobody. Very few people have done the studies where instead of saying, you know, on the 18 items, uh, the 17 items on the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, how do people do on antidepressants? They've done that study over and over again because that's what the FDA wants them to do. And they come up with these really lousy results, and they massage them a little bit, and they, you know, who knows what they do. They, they do 75 studies to get 35 that say that it sort of works, and then they get their drug approved. They don't care after that. Yeah. Instead of that, what they should be doing is exploring the, what I would call Prozac consciousness. What are these drugs doing? People are trading in their sex lives for these drugs. People are, you know, uh, uh, in love with these drugs, or if not in love, then at least willing to put up with their side effects and not go through the difficulty of getting off of them. I think that these drugs are powerful. I think they change people's consciousness in a more subtle way than smoking a joint does, but not in an entirely different way from the way a recreational drug does. In, in the sense that they change the way that you experience yourself and your world. Yeah. And there's at least one study that shows that the major effects of antidepressants and the ones that show up robustly aren't on this, this very circumscribed category of depression. They're on personality. They're on the way people actually, the, the, the structure of their selves, of their selves. And what happens, to put it crudely, is that the drugs make them more into more like the people that they want to be. And that goes along with observations that have been made by, by really good writers like Peter Kramer, with whom I disagree about many things, but he's a, he's a great writer, and he's a very careful patient observer. And he observes that people say they feel less sensitive to rejection. They feel more confident. They feel more um, in control of their lives. And so on and so forth. And so these are, your point is, let me make sure I got a little confused about the, the Kirsch findings because I don't know them well enough and you might want to repeat them. But the, the basic point I think you're making is they're, they're, the, the efficacy of these pharmaceutical treatments of depression are very unclear on depression. They do a little bit better. They obviously help some people, but so do placebos. And – but they have this powerful effect. It's nothing to do with depression that makes people like taking them. Exactly. Okay. And, and so, exactly right. You said it better than I could have. People complain, people claim that the, the studies showing, the, 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 the antidepressant studies that, where they show that they don't really work means that the drugs don't do anything. The drugs do plenty, but there's no financial interest in figuring out what it, what it is. In fact, there may be an anti-interest. Well, that's because if, right, if, if it only makes you feel more powerful, then it's like scotch. And scotch, right, you've got to sell that in a store at a full price. You can't get, the, can't get the Medicare to cover it, and you can't get your insurance company to pay for it through your employer. Exactly. So, so this actually is an Stunts. argument for making Prozac over the counter. Yeah. And, and, or, or turning it into a, you know, the way we deal with consciousness-altering drugs is we make them illegal. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then we let there be a black market for yeah, them. Yeah, that's right. So, so that, and that's, to me, if there's a scandal here, that's the scandal. The scandal is that the drugs are out there. They're, they're just barely squeaking by the, 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 the licit, illicit line. But they're being used in a way that in any other drug would be considered illicit. Yeah, so it's it's brave new world. It's a little soma. Pick up, pick yourself up every day. 
I, you know, I, I don't know if you're right about that. I, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I don't think we know. Right, yeah, that's a better way to say it. Prozac doesn't interest me as a drug. I mean, I, I, I've taken lots of psychoactive drugs. From what I've heard about people's experiences, I have not been tempted, which is more than I can yeah. say for a lot of other drugs. Let- I, I've never been tempted to take the stuff, but... I, so I come from a place of ignorance about this, and I'm not willing to turn myself into a guinea pig at this point because I'm just not interested enough. But somebody's going to do that work. But I want to talk about the major depression. Okay. That, that psychiatrist who writes you the hate mail or sends you the angry email saying, I'm not going to let you interview me. You're dangerous because you're threatening the opportunity to save people's lives through these wonderful drugs. So I'm not talking about somebody who just you know feels a little flat in the morning and that Prozac picks him up. I'm talking about – or a little bit depressed or a little bit sad. I'm talking about somebody who, who – and this was you. You talk about it in the book. Somebody who's on the floor. Yeah. Somebody who can't function the way society expects them to. And, of course, I'm open to the possibility that there are times you should lay on the floor and, and cry for the world or for yourself or for your loved ones. But it's not socially uh, normal. It's not in the – it's not – it's a tale. It's out in the tales. Of behavior, and the psychiatrists who don't like your work say that you're preventing, you're encouraging people to do without or to be uh, misled. When in fact there's a there is a a cure for them. We don't understand the biochemical part of it, but surely these drugs uh, can help them. Is that what they would say? Uh, That would be the most reasonable. Are they right? um, To uh, that would be the most reasonable argument um, to make, but. Uh, you know, and, and are they right? Uh, well, statistically, no, because um, uh, even though Prozac does better with severely depressed people than with not severely depressed people, it doesn't do very well. And that is the sixty percent might be the best they can hope for. Well, you know, there are treatment approaches. First, we have to remember that um, that, that when it comes to severe depression, um, the old Antidepressants do um, just as well as Prozac does. What's an old antidepressant? Uh, like uh, uh, the most famous was probably imipramine or Elevil. And do, they were th- developed in the early in the early sixties. And how well do they do? Sixty? You know, they, they in, 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 in the right patient, they're you know a sixty, maybe a sixty percent. Sixty percent of the people get better uh, than they would have if they'd just taken a placebo. And the other 40% get shunted onto a different one to try a different approach? Right. And, and so, you know, then there's, uh, you know, the, 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 the quiet, I suppose, the dirty secret of uh, the psychiatry of mood disorders is that there's still a fair amount of electroshock therapy going on out there. Really? Yeah. And, and in fact, uh, it is a fairly effective procedure with a certain subpopulation of depressed people. I mean, I think, I think that the problem is that even if we can observe a fairly homogeneous set of behaviors and experiences that we would call, would, we would describe the way you just mentioned, um, even if we could do that, there may not be only one, there um, undoubtedly is not only one brain pathway to get there. There are probably many different ways to get there brain is immensely complex. You know, there's 100 trillion connections to worry about. It's a big number. Yeah, whatever. You know, it's one of those big numbers. Right? You, it's almost the size of our deficit. You, and, um, yeah, just about. And we, we have, uh, we have uh, probably, you know, many, many ways to have a depression. So I'm not sure that the targeted molecule drug approach is ever going to pay off in big ways for people who are depressed in, in the way that you just described. I don't doubt for a moment that there is a group of people out there who are um, depressed in a way that they can't function, that they, that it sh- they should, whatever works best for them should be the treatment. I also don't doubt for a moment there are people who have depression for no reason at all, and, you know, other than that there's something wacky with their brain chemistry. Um, we haven't even got to the point where we can figure out who those people are, let alone what to do for them. In other words, and this is the part I think is the getting back to the question of science, we like to think, and I guess before I started reading your work and, and thinking about this in more detail, we like to think that 
somebody who can't get out of bed in the morning has a serotonin deficiency or a dopamine imbalance or we don't know that. No, no, we don't know that. Would your opponents agree with you? Uh, yeah, they, well, they'd have to because we don't know it. <laughs> I mean, they'll, they'll tell you, well, there's all these findings and they'll be right about that. But to get it down to the, the, this, this serotonin, imb- no, there's no way. I mean, it, it, you know, the, uh, a knowledgeable doctor will tell you that something is going on that maybe in some cases involves serotonin. But at this point, I think that they've stopped looking at serotonin as the end and looking at it as the finger pointing to the end. That It's a black box. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a black box. Yeah, That's you what put it the is. drug in and something better comes out. But of course, just to go back to the macroeconomics example, uh, when a lot of people are unemployed, the black box says we have insufficient demand. And so therefore, government's got to spend more money. And then we try to assess whether that worked. And of course, it's very difficult to do. Yeah. So, so it's the same issue. We have an inductive theory of cause and effect, which we can't test directly. We apply the drug. If it works, we might conclude that it, it hit the, the nerve center it was supposed to, or the transmitter, but it, it's hard to measure that. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think one difference that's important is that, you know, most of the Keynesian econo- economists that I talk to or read, um, and I, I have to say I'm a little sympathetic to this perspective, they do believe in what they're saying. Oh, absolutely. But if you talk to a doctor, if, a doc- if you go in there as a patient and the doctor tells you you have a chemical imbalance that's causing your depression, he's telling you something he knows isn't true. Or he ought to know it isn't true. But it could be true. <laughs> uh, no, I think that it's... I, I actually think that the serotonin theory of depression is dead. Okay. I mean, I, I, there's probably somebody who's going to tell me I'm wrong, but I researched... You saw my book. It's got 800 footnotes in it. I, I don't think... The, I think the serotonin theory has, you know, been left behind. Okay. So, yes... Something changes when you tweak serotonin, but that's only because it's the means to an end. Your, Something else is going on. Your work reminded me, uh, of course, of Thomas Zaz, who wrote a book a long time ago. Uh, which 50, I, year, 50 years this year. Uh, called The Myth of Mental Illness, which I read when I was young and I haven't read in a long time. But he also enraged a lot of psychiatrists. Yeah, and still does, by the way. Yes, uh, suggesting something similar. How does your work? Uh, relate to his, and, and what are your thoughts? Well, I think I think that Sats is. Um, I think that the difference between what Sats is saying and what I'm saying is this: Sats wants to draw a line in the sand between real diseases and what he calls problems of living, and he thinks that real diseases should come under the purview of the mental health people, and he thinks that um, problems of living should not. I, it's similar to your, you have, well, you're, you're, in, you're in that air, ballpark. Except for one thing. I don't think that line uh, is going to be established. I don't even know if it's worth trying. Uh, I think that what, it start, what you have to assume before you can even think about it that way is that we really know what a disease is. And that what a disease is is a, a form of suffering, as I said earlier, caused by a biochemical pathogen. That particular definition of disease is only about 150 years old. It is clearly driven by historical and economic rather than scientific forces. It is a a definition of disease that's yielded great results in terms of antibiotics, in terms of insulin and other things. Unbelievable. But it's also a definition of disease that is beginning not to yield so much good fruit because there are so many diseases that are so complex that we can't even figure out if there's a pathogen, let alone what it is. And in fact, what I think is that a disease should be understood better as a form of suffering that a society decides it wants to devote resources to relieving. Science, as we go back to the beginning of this discussion, science is one area that we turn to to try to help us determine what kinds of suffering ought to be worthy of relief. And what we've seized upon is that those that show up under a microscope are the ones that are really diseases and therefore in in need of relief. I think that the fact that even if there's stupid criteria 
that 30% of the American people can show a positive on a test for depression. I think that means something. I don't think it means that they've got an epidemic of brain chemical problems. I think that it means something about how we live. Yeah, no doubt about that. And that's, that uh, social resources should be devoted, healthcare resources, should be devoted to that problem. It's just that those resources might maybe go beyond, you know, pills. Yeah, I, I don't agree with you there, but it's, um, I, I, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting distinction between uh, – I understand your point. Yeah, and, and if we disagree about it, it's because of ideological positions that you and I might have that right. are different. Right, philosophical differences. Right. But, but the point is that that's the difference between me and Sass. I don't think – I am not hopeful that we're going to draw that line in the sand anytime soon, and, and maybe we never will. Uh, is there such a is there a um, is schizophrenia a disease? Well, schizophrenia is probably a hundred diseases. I mean, understood as biochemical problems. Schizophrenia. I mean, that was that was another thing we were hoping. You know, schizophrenia, ma- manic depression, what we call bipolar illness, would show up as you know the result of a gene or the result of a simple, relatively simple biochemical uh, problem. But it turns out that. Um, they're not. You know, there's no single pathway to the hallucinations and so on that we call schizophrenia. I mean, it's fascinating. There is a temptation to say that, it, as, as your, again, intellectual antagonists do say, well, we just haven't found it yet. We just have to look longer. Again, I, by the way, very similar to what uh, an interview I did with uh, Ricardo Reich here, a macroeconomist who said, We've mastered monetary policy, which I think I disagree with him. And then he said, fiscal policy, we need to just study a little longer. And I said, you know, 70 years, I'm thinking, that's a while. Well, wasn't it, wasn't it Keynes who said, in the long run, we're all dead? Yeah. Well, well there you go. Yeah, maybe. I mean, if you expand the time horizon out far enough, <laughs> I suppose that's probably true. Yeah, it's and such a that, deep... that gets back to my book, The Noble Lie, where I write about people who want to live forever or come back in the future when we solve all these problems. Yeah. Uh, we're almost out of time. We're out of time, but I just I, I want to ask you if you if you still have time, mm-hmm. um, talk about your encounter with the Unabomber uh, and how the struggle over the definition of whether he was schizophrenic, whether he was schizophrenic or quote crazy, um, and how that played out. It's rather an extraordinary story. You can't do justice to it, but um, just the tension between uh, his lawyer's desire to call him crazy. The diagnoses that, of course, he had to be crazy, and what he wanted is fascinating. Well, so, so yeah, so Kaczynski was, uh, you know, convicted and uh, in jail, and his lawyers to get him to save him from the death penalty, which had just been reinstituted at the federal level. Um, his lawyers went for the mitigating circumstance of Kaczynski being crazy, uh, and Kaczynski refused to submit to psychiatric exams. And finally, what happened was that he um, fired his lawyers because they wouldn't get off of it. He asked to represent himself, at which point the judge said, well, yeah, but if you want to represent yourself, I have to show that you're competent. And that requires a psychiatric exam. It's a catch-22. He he lost that particular chess game. Yeah. And in the psychiatric exam, he was determined uh, to be paranoid schizophrenic. And some of the evidence for his paranoid schizophrenia was the fact that he wouldn't submit to psychiatric exams in the first place. It's an absolutely uh, chilling and also um, compelling in, in the sense that it's concise example of all of the problems we've been talking about, that the power, once it's collected in psychiatry and, you know, you're able to pathologize anything, um, it can get used, in this case, not just against Ted Kaczynski, but really, I think, against all of us, because it didn't do justice to the problems that he both talked about and also represented to say, well, the guy is paranoid schizophrenic, not to mention he didn't really meet any of the diagnostic criteria. Um, And my involvement with him was really just an attempt to um, write about that problem um, through his biography, uh, which which is a project that I never did get to, but I did manage to have a fairly interesting and prolonged encounter with him. The the chapter in my book that's about this um, is just the short version of my um, of a long article that I wrote in a journal called McSweeney's um, yeah. about this story because it unfolded over a couple of years, 
and uh, um, it's you know more complex than what I what I wrote about, but there it is. So, again, just to come full circle, um, somebody who loses a loved one and struggles to cope with life, we could argue they're diseased, or we could argue that they're going through a human process that they that we're supposed to go through. And similarly, you can argue that Ted Kaczynski is a, is a crazy man or he's evil, and they're not the yeah. same thing. Well, exactly, and, and much depends on what side of that you come down on. Um, if you decide that he's evil, then you then have to decide what the good is. And in the case of Kaczynski, that will lead you into all sorts of very interesting questions because, of course, this is the same problem that was raised by John Brown when he sure. you know, committed a horrible massacre, but on the other hand, 150 years later, he doesn't look like such a bad guy. Yeah. Uh, so we don't know what, what ultimately will become of Kaczynski. On the other hand, if you decide that he's crazy, that ends the quest problem right there. Well, he's just crazy, you know, give him some drugs and uh, stop. And that's where we are with him, correct? Yeah, uh, what's that? He's alive. He's alive. He's in prison for the rest of his life. Because he's crazy. Well, he's not defined to be crazy. because he's crazy. He's yeah. in prison because he killed people. Yeah, but he's not been executed because he's been deemed to be a crazy person. Right, right, right. And and while I don't think it's fair to say he wanted to, you know, commit suicide by execution, I think it is fair to say that he wanted to be um he wanted to be wherever he was, he wanted to be on the basis of the truth and not some fabrication. Yeah. That that was the really fascinating part of that um of that section of the book, really quite quite extraordinary. Um so in closing, um, where do you think we're headed on these issues? Well, I, I mean, the, the, in, in terms of the um, question of medicine acquiring more power to s- settle our, uh, our uh, moral disputes, I, I think that there's a huge amount of momentum and that we will continue to turn to science and medicine to do that. I also think that the emerging complexity of these things is going to make that, uh, the answers become less and less satisfying. Uh, in terms of specifically of, of psychiatry, I think you're going to see that as the psychiatrists go to revise their latest, di- their latest revision of their diagnostic manual, I think that uh, we're going to finally have to grapple with the fact that psychiatrists still don't even know what a mental illness is, let alone what the mental illnesses are. They don't even know how to define mental illness yet. And I think we're going to see that that's, that problem is going to emerge. Well, give them time, Gary. Give them time. <laughs> My guest today has been Gary Greenberg. Gary, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.